what I propose to do is to talk in principle about the tragedy uh, that has hit Russia. You may think that's a slightly odd word to use, but it is a reminder of two things in my view. First, because what has been done to Russia under Putin's rule is not at all the best thing for Russia or in its general interests. So first theme of Russian foreign policy that they wish to pursue is the idea of Russia as a, quote, great power. If you ask any Russian spokesman, official spokesman, what is Russia's interest, it always comes down to a variation on the theme that Moscow should dominate in the interest of its own security, its space within Russian territory and beyond it. They act on the assumption, uh, which is inherent in Eurasian theology, uh, and I remember when I was at school, people used to talk about Mackinder, who spoke about the heartland policies and the world was made up of a heartland and then fits around it and so on and so forth. They speak in terms of centers of power, meaning not, let's say, Paris or London, but a center of power which would be dominated by, in their case, Russia or China or the European Union. The thing about this is that really these heartlands these centers of power do not actually exist. You cannot say, as they do, that America is a superpower which controls the world. Russia cannot actually, America can't actually control uh, the nations of Europe, it can't control Israel. Of course it is a tremendously power, powerful country, but there is something quite different. The Russian theology has it that there ought to be concert of agreement between those principal powers and they should be telling the rest of us what to do. I don't know if any of you have read the, the uh, speech or heard the speech that Putin gave to uh, the UNGA last September or had the still more deep pleasure of reading an article by Foreign Minister Lavrov in Russia in Foreign Affairs dated the 3rd of March. Uh, that argues that, for example, the Yalta Division uh, was a guarantor of peace Lavrov actually said it was very good for prosperity, including in Eastern Europe, by implication they expect more of Western Europe, uh, and that essentially we should be returning to that sort of basic idea. That sort of thesis is, does strike a chord among many people in the West who argue that um, we should respect uh, Russia's interests in its relationship with uh, the countries immediately around it, and that Russia is entitled to some sort of defense glasses uh, against the, the, the threat of, of uh, the outside world, essentially. Um, the defense glasses argument is entirely self-defeating. First of all, let us say that the Russians are able to, to install and uh, uh, maintain a compliant government in, in, uh, in Ukraine. In Ukraine, I have no doubt at all that even if they succeeded in doing that sort of thing, civil society there is so strong and the wish to, uh, uh, for people to have a say in their government is so strong, that couldn't last. But even if it did, what would be the implication? The implication would be you'd have to establish one in Belarus. When you've got one in Belarus, Poland too. It's a never-ending cycle like that. A proper policy following national interest would be to try not to force your friendship on people, but actually to work with them in order to, to uh, um, have a proper peaceful relationship. The second Russian delusion is enshrined in its obsession with the United States. Somehow for Russia, it has never succeeded in liberating itself from having been the Soviet Union. In its mind, a direct and uh, 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 relationship with the United States is determinant, and the United States should treat Russia with, quote, respect, unquote, in the sense that anything in the world should be 
agreed with Russia, and there should be direct cooperation like that. But the fact is, the United States is nothing like Russia. This news do I know. Uh, the United States has many relationships throughout the world. It's far more powerful economically. So that even if Washington should accept that as a, <coughs> a, a, a sort of guide to action, it could never deliver and would not wish to deliver. But that eats very deeply at the Russian foreign policy establishment soul, and particularly for Putin. Russians also, I think rightly, have considerable doubts as to whether the U European Union or uh, the West in general and NATO will maintain its co co cohesion. Um, our first speaker mentioned the lack of defense spending on our part. Uh, the Russians are very conscious of the way that we at first went on the assumption that somehow Russia would become more and more like us and that it was going to, to behave in ways with which we were familiar. Uh, and I'm sure that they have very considerable doubts as to our, our, our cohesion. All these lead to profound misjudgments of policy by Russia. That's partly because Putin has been in power for 16 years. Same narrow group of people. Same feeling of, of uh, uh, pressure from below. Same feeling that in the end, the Kremlin walls are there to defend him against his own people. That is a feeling which has increased markedly over the years. People just uh, sometimes regard the Russian policy as on a, uh, made on some sort of chessboard. They do have strengths of uh, able to take immediate action. They do not have the strength of thinking their policy through very well. But I do think we, we, should, we need to take into account more than we do instinctively the emotional content of the way they make, make policy. Putin's choice of repression and retrenchment in May and uh, 2012 is now irreversible. The power vertical is a delusion if that is meant to achieve effective control from the top. Increasing corruption is its inevitable consequence, including the corruption of the intelligence which gets to the top. You cannot imagine the pilot of the um, SU-24 that was shot down for straying into Turkey saying in any fashion at all to uh, the Kremlin, yes, yes, I was over the border, fair dues. He's not going to say that. He's going to say, of course, I was not over the border. That's a small way of, of, of illustrating a general phenomenon. Who is going to tell Putin that he's got it wrong? Who is going to tell Putin that seizing Crimea was a, a, a probably a mistake and he should have expected the consequences? Who is going to tell Putin that he cannot actually win in Donetsk and, and, and Luhansk? No one. In rejecting substantive economic reforms, and the political reforms that are applied by those, one can understand in a way, if you're, you're Putin, because the difficulties of reforming Russia are immense and growing. But it was also to trap Russia into its present economic and social difficulties. That, for a time, will suit those directly in, in, interested in preserving their power, but it is a betrayal of Russia's wider interests. Maybe there's some apprehension at the top of the present system as to the dangers of the construction of what amounts to a condition of latent anarchy in the country. There are at least signs of such feeling in the warnings against color revolutions, their preparations for what should be very easy elections in uh, uh, September this year, and the decision to establish a national uh, guard answerable to Putin uh, and with extraordinarily extensive powers to persecute people at his will. So my uh, conclusion is that Putin has in fact locked himself 
into a triple dynamic of failure. He's the prisoner of his past. The state beyond his immediate reach has atrophied, and he has neither the and that state has neither the executive ability to revive uh, Russia's economic or societal fortunes. And the search for legitimacy as a means of, by a means of establishing Russia as, in its own regard, a great power, is actually beyond the, the Kremlin's reach. For all, the, 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 there are those in the West who believe we should humor it. We don't know who, when, or what will succeed Putin. But I do think there is one thing we do know, that it is that person, or that group, or uh, that chaos, in a way, will need to begin to consider changes. And making changes in Russia will be deeply disruptive. That is likely to prove a time of danger for us all. So that's a rather a bleak uh, uh, presentation. I do not think we can know what is going to happen uh, during the rest of Putin's uh, reign. I do think that it's going to be increasingly dangerous, though there may be tactical moves towards making it uh, uh, more accommodating for tactical reasons. What we have to recognize in dealing with this situation is that the idea of, quote, business as usual is a chimera. Russia will not now attract the sort of scale of investment that we hope for. It is not going to move under Putin in the direction of flexibility and change internally. It is going to face increasing uh, societal and economic problems. And the danger from that is that our ability to react with it is going to be diminished. So um, as far as the, the, the Baltics are concerned, the implication of what I've said so far is that these countries are not a primary objective of uh, uh, Putin's wishes at present. Again, I would have focus pretty heavily on Ukraine as the country he must win over in some or get under control in some fashion. Mm -hmm. But what they are uh, is a risk of unintended consequences. The first speaker referred to the military gestures and adventures that the Russians have been undertaking in the Baltic area, presumably with the aim, so far as they have a clear aim, of making the Baltic Ocean into a Russian lake. That already has, has made people in Finland and Sweden consider possible membership of NATO. And like most Russians, uh, policies, it has succeeded in increasing the number of its, uh, if not enemies, at least people who are suspicious and, and uh, 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 seeking protection from Russia. Um, the EU and the West as a whole have plenty of other direct distractions, but what we must try and try to do is to avoid inconsistency and a, 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 a purpose uh, a, a relaxing in vigilance at a time when um, Russian plans and motivations could mislead, mislead us as to the Kremlin's uh, intentions. <coughs> I do not think that, that <coughs> in using the word Russian tragedy, that that was an exaggeration at the beginning. I'm sorry for the country of which, uh, uh, when I left at the end of Yeltsin, I thought had the chance of evolving into a more liberal and better organized direction, has turned away from that and is turned into a country that cannot control its own policies, is dependent on a single person who is himself has to be affected by the position he's in. My analogy for him is the analogy of Macbeth. Uh, he is condemned to carry on more or less as, as he, as he uh, has, probably at an increasing level, 
and in the end there is no way out for him personally. But when that change does come, then I think one can be optimistic as to the decency and wishes of the Russian people to hope that then we can begin once again to hope for better relations with, uh, with Russia and what we all aim at, which would be, in the words of Gorbachev, I think, a, a Europe whole and fair free. That is not an offer of president. As a civil servant and a career diplomat, I have been involved in formulating uh, uh, and implementing, uh, more implementing than formulating, but uh, one way or another, both of national security policy for more than 20 years, and it has never been a boring job. Um, well, I would submit to you, however, that the last couple of years we have been going through particularly challenging times in international security relationships, especially in light of uh, uh, quite high expectations for consolidating Europe uh, all and free and at peace in the aftermath of prolonged and hostile Cold War period. Uh, as some of you may, may recall, on January 13 this year, my country commemorated the 25th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday when 40 unarmed civilians died and uh, hundreds of uh, uh, others were injured while defending Vilnius TV tower um, from Soviet troops. Uh, this tragic moment uh, left a deep mark in uh, our popular conscience, and this made us well aware uh, that uh, freedom and independence has its price. Uh, it's nothing else but in our minds, our hearts, and our hands to defend the country, to rebuild it, and to secure it. Uh, let me take it straight by offering the following sketchy remarks on Russia. Uh, obviously, we can't escape Russia, uh, because it is a, uh, a challenge for our region. It is a challenge for my country. Uh, we have some other challenges as well. We have some challenges in how do we cope with this challenge, uh, because those are also present. But I think we need to uh, be quite clear and name, just uh, try to do it in a very sketchy way. Uh, Russia's invasion and ongoing destabilization of Ukraine and illegal annexation of Crimea have fundamentally undermined European security re-emphasizing the importance of geopolitics and ending post-Cold War dreams of irreversible, peaceful, and democratic change in Eastern Europe. The Kremlin has rejected the values, principles, and structures jointly agreed in Europe after the Second World War and following the end of the Cold War. Moscow has chosen to use military power to undermine the rules-based international system. Russia not only no longer wants to be integrated in a common Euro-Atlantic community, it actually actively seeks to prevent other countries, especially in Central and Eastern European nations, especially those that have not managed to get into European structures from seeking closer relations with Europe and the West. And we are facing Russia which seeks to return to the days of spheres of influence and hegemony over its so-called near abroad. We witness Russia's drive to define uh, uh, itself culturally in opposition to what it portrays as a decadent Western values, as a smokescreen for suppression of freedom and civil society at home. In the last four years, new and increasingly authoritarian laws have further restricted basic freedoms for Russian civil society. With its actions in Ukraine, Russia struck a serious blow, not only to the security uh, mm, security system, but also to the international, uh, international legal basis for it. Uh, Russia persists, persists with its effort to undermine Ukraine politically, economically, and militarily. It has yet to live up to its part of the Minsk agreements, even though there have been some uh, few lulls in the fighting. The challenge, uh, Russia challenge, is not just in Europe. Uh, let's admit it, it has entered civil war in Syria, but not as part of uh, the uh, global coalition to destroy ISIL, but rather to bolster the position of its ally, President Assad, who is responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of his own citizens, and to establish a new outpost of Russian power on the eastern Mediterranean. 
Russia's aggress aggressive military buildup continues, all justified by a false narrative of Western encyclement and betrayal. We see militarization of Kaliningrad region, modernization of Russian armed forces, frequent large-scale military activities, including SNAP exercises. And Russian Navy in the Baltic Sea constantly interferes with commercial navigation and strategic commercial projects, such as Balt, uh, Baltic electricity grid from Sweden to Lithuania. Other European and Northern American regions also experienced incidents involving Russian Navy and Air Forces, uh, most recently buzzing the, the US uh, naval ship in the Baltic, as well as reconnaissance plane uh, over the Baltic. But not only in the Baltic region. We have North Europe, the UK, Netherlands, Canada, Alaska. Behind the efforts to undermine the international security architecture uh, lay Putin's political ambitions, both inside and outside of his own country, which remain, in our assessment, extremely high. He's trying to impose his will on neighbors, and not only on neighbors, but also on others. Um, we see a different type of warfare, ambiguous or hybrid, as some, some people put it, uh, warfare, conducted by military without insignia, seemingly by paramilitary formations with provisions of advanced Russian-made weaponry, supported by intelligence, command and control. And to make things even more complex, this war is supported by cyber attacks, information operations, and cynical propaganda campaigns with Russia's officials and Kremlin-controlled media, denying the blame and distorting the truth, as we heard from our keynote speaker today, and as we will hear, I believe, tomorrow in the panel that will cover the um, propaganda campaign and how to counter it. Uh, it's important that Russia undertook fundamental restructuring, reform, and rearmament of its armed forces after the war in Georgia. Uh, modernization plans uh, call for the armed forces to have 30% modern equipment by 2015, which is by last year, and 70% by 2020. And uh, we observed that these plans are generally on track to achieve main goals despite of, uh, overall declining state budgets. Uh, Russia's integrated anti-aircraft and anti-ship capabilities now cover large swaths of NATO territory. <coughs> Russia has stationed large numbers of combat forces on NATO's borders and has demonstrated it can move them with great speed as well as use cyber and other hybrid tactics with great skill. Uh, at the same time, with all of that, Russia has eliminated avenue after avenue military transparency by suspending its participation in the CFE regime, by disregarding all other military confidence building measures, deliberately creating insecurity wherever it can. And number and scale of exercises that they've been doing are just uh, enormous. Uh, growing, growing permanent anti-access and area denial, so-called A2AD capabilities in the Barents, Baltic, and Black Sea regions, as well as initial capabilities in the Eastern Mediterranean, and please uh, note that it's not only the Baltic Sea. Uh, you can see it move uh, in the arc uh, from north uh, to Baltic Sea, Black Sea, and to East Mediterranean. The speed of decision making and implementation uh, could enable Russia in some regions on its periphery to achieve initial local superiority, seize territory, deny access through layered air and missile defense and coastal defense forces, and deter through nuclear posturing uh, in the event that if they take a decision to risk military conflict. Well, let's be clear, though Russia does not match NATO in terms of troop member numbers and economic strength, military assertiveness and expansionism are built into the Russian political system. And the increasingly capable military instrument is aligned in support of Russian foreign policy, as demonstrated in Syria, ready to be employed to achieve Moscow's strategic political objectives. Um, in Crimea and Syria, Russia demonstrated the ability to achieve strategic effect through employment of limited forces. Um, given the character of increasingly unpredictable government in Moscow, and, and it is unpredictable in terms of its actions, uh, although it is predictable in my personal uh, uh, view, in terms of its lasting. 
um, as well as, as its strategic activity in countries surrounding Russia, it is not entirely clear what, uh, where or and when Russia's revanchist geopolitical agenda will end. Uh, so in this context, what are the responses? What should be the response? I've, I've listed you a number of uh, uh, quite uh, uh, starking uh, facts and examples. Um, indeed, the regime has created new strategic reality for NATO and indeed for the whole Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, now, after 25 years of focusing on out-of-area crisis management and on goodwill partnership with uh, our neighbor <coughs> Russia, now we must re-emphasize our original mission of collective defense and deterrence. Uh, it is uh, in Lithuania's view that in the run-up to the July summit in Warsaw, we will have to bolster our defense posture, adapt our alliance to the realities we face today. Uh, we have built on the readiness action plan that was uh, launched in Wales uh, two years ago. It is true, uh, we are now much better prepared uh, in, uh, and more ready to deal with many challenges we face uh, than it was yesterday. Uh, we, for that matter, we undertook a commitment to stop the decline in military spending. And that is already a huge, huge uh, uh, change. Uh, we have moved swiftly to implement uh, the readiness action plan, uh, the very rapid uh, uh, reaction spearhead force, the BJDF, is on track. We inaugurated as an alliance uh, a series of small headquarters, the NATO force integration units across Eastern allies to help coordinate training and exercises and uh, facilitate reinforcements. But we have still to be more ambitious and achieve more substance uh, on the, that very same uh, BJDF. Um, the SACUR should be able to move uh, BJTF more quickly within 48 hours. We have to do more in prepositioning military equipment and supplies on the territory of Eastern Allies. We have to do more in the south of NATO in terms of facing different kind of threats. And we should enhance NATO standing naval forces with more ships and more types of ships. In this context, the UK announcement of, uh, on six ships to be deployed in the Baltic Sea is very much welcome. Uh, we have also, as an alliance, uh, uh, updated our defense plans concerning the Baltic countries and Poland by adopting the gradu graduate response plans to develop uh, readiness the plan to, that includes a review of joint exercises, etc. Uh, also, there has been some uh, uh, Re-engagement by the United States in Europe, as uh, most of you might know, uh, they came up with the ERI uh, initiative, European Reassurance Initiative. Uh, they announced uh, that they will be storing battle tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and other heavy weapons uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, also, there is uh, a commitment to, to preposition uh, APS of the size of the division in Germany, Belgium, and Netherlands. All is that absolutely welcome development. Uh, now, with the, alongside NATO, obviously, there's a question that national efforts are of much importance as common allied efforts are. And here we talk about Article 3, uh, the commitment that each NATO member country has to, uh, to build resilience and to make, that your, to make, to make uh, sure that your defense capacity is being upgraded. Uh, in Lithuania, as well as in other Baltic states, uh, as, as it is in Poland, uh, we have uh, put forward ambitious plans for this year and beyond. Uh, we increased defense budget by 60%. Uh, all government parties in Lithuania agreed to increase defense spending up to 2% by 2018. Uh, we finalized the process of creation of 2nd Lithuanian Land Forces Brigade, reinstated con conscription, uh, introduced National Rapid Response Force to counter unconventional uh, hybrid threats with readiness of 24 hours, uh, uh, continue to improve infrastructure. There are many things that are ongoing. Uh, uh, we began to procure modern weaponry. Uh, we have continued strengthening our resilience against cyber threats and other forms of hybrid warfare, including measures of bolstering our energy security 
which has been a top priority in Lithuania's political agenda and most tracking in bipartisan way. Uh, just in 2014, we made a breakthrough in ensuring gas supply diversification as the implementation of the EU third package was finalized and the LNG terminal, Lithuanian uh, liquefied gas uh, terminal independence, started functioning. Electricity links with Sweden and Poland became operational in 2015 and tripartite agreements on the financial assistance for gas links with Poland were signed with Poland and EU. So there, there are huge efforts uh, uh, to respond to these security challenges nationally. And I think if we are doing it uh, coherently, if we are doing it in a coordinated and meaningful way, uh, it has enormous potential to contribute to internal, internal political stability, first of all, but also to military preparedness and energy security and all things. Uh, Yes, I see that I, I need to round up. Just to give a final, final thought, uh, w w what is wrong then, you may ask? W w what is not, uh, what is a challenge? Uh, you seem to be doing fine and the NATO is coming along and the Warsaw summit is approaching. Uh, of course, the unpredictability is there with Russia uh, and it, it, is, it is to remain. Uh, we will not be able to, uh, to clear the crystal ball and, and see what's gonna happen. I think we need additional, uh, maybe little push in terms of uh, solidifying our deterrence. Uh, and that uh, may come uh, as a very good uh, development and deliverable for the Warsaw Summit. And that particular push could include more uh, enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states and Poland as well as in maybe in, in, in you know, south, southeast European countries like Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, there is a military advice that is coming up at the moment as we speak that uh, enhanced forward presence should be, uh, maintained, should be launched in the Baltic states, in each of the Baltic states, on the level of the battle group of the battalion with the framework nation that could be leading this, these three battalions in the Baltic states that could form eventually a brigade we believe this could be a, an enormously important uh, step forward in terms of reassure, in terms of not only reassuring but also deterring <laughs> President Putin from making any kind of attempts to make a bold step and uh, one way or another uh, challenge uh, the NATO territory, uh, namely the Baltic states. So these things, if they were to happen, would put us on the very right track. We would relearn deterrence, we would come back to, uh, to the 21st century deterrence. That would be different from the last century one. But that would be based on mobility, on readiness to reinforce, and the most important, on a tripwire of multinational force in the, Balt in the Baltic states that could uh, be of, of essence. Um, with that, uh, obviously there are many other things that uh, uh, we may talk about. I mean, there's a NATO-Russia Council meeting that, they, that takes place today in Brussels. Uh, we, we have been uh, seeing this as, a, as, a, as an exercise uh, uh, just in the course of bigger uh, objective for NATO to define the long-term relationship with Russia. Um, I think uh, the meeting today will not create any fantastic news, uh, but I think it's important to keep dialogue with Russia, provided we are strong we communicate strength as an alliance that uh, any move on part of Russian Federation, whatever the purpose of that would be, would be met with, with, a, with a very strong resistance and we will fight back. Oh, that, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. How long uh, my memory goes back or kind of my knowledge goes back uh, knowing Russian, I thought that why not to say that my uh, knowledge of Russia started from the moment I was <laughs> in 1969, uh, uh, that time in uh, occupied Estonia. Uh, but uh, yes, it uh, tells actually a little bit more than just uh, the date of my birth, but it's uh, actually extremely important to understand that those who are coming from the region, like Baltic states, as we are here as well, from all three Baltic countries. The understanding of that, what is going on in the East from us actually comes not only from headlines, from history books, but also from very, very personal uh, experience, from families, from stories, from personal stories. 
and actually that actually gives you this essence to understand the real logic uh, or sometimes very illogically irrational way uh, how uh, Russia or Russians act. But it, it may just I would like to very very shortly to give my uh, opinion about what what is happening, why it's happening, and in, in here perhaps I'm a little bit going to contradict to this uh, very common understanding that uh, that something what happened uh, with Russia had, has happened during Putin's reign or under the Putin during last let's say 10 or 15 years. Uh, I worked in Moscow as correspondent from 94 to 97 and uh, also uh, had a great hopes uh, that Russia will uh, turn uh, uh, on the path uh, leaving behind being hostage of, of its own history uh, building uh, all the time empire back if it's uh, if it's broken or so but it's uh, in 95 I happened to be at uh, one uh, seminar in uh, that times uh, uh, party office I went there not as a journalist but as a person who uh, I'm a graduated historian and uh, let's say a bit more deep interest to Russian history. Uh, there was a seminar about liberalism uh, of Russia and history of liberalism in Russia and um, it was very interesting actually to, to hear uh, the old professors who perhaps years ago taught about uh, Marxism and Leninism and Communism how they turn to talk about liberalism and democracy. Uh, but uh, why I'm saying, telling this is that at one sp specific moment, one old professor giving a speech said that I'm sure that even my children or grandchildren will fight for Baltic ports because they belong to us. Whole point. That's it. And then he continued about liberalism. <laughs> in Russia. Look, um, if you remember, very beginning of 90s, uh, establishing frozen conflicts in Moldova, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, in uh, uh, Georgia, uh, end of the day also now we see in uh, Ukraine, this, has, this is a very clear uh, path from the very beginning and it tells uh, what is very deep rooted in uh, Russian mind and also leadership mind, not only leadership mind but also people's mind as uh, uh, artist who st uh, stands up there it, it tells that Russia has to be great, always great and something what links to the greatness is territory territory what once belonged to Russia as empire, as continental empire plus influence over certain territories or regions is something what is so essential that uh, is very common to basically all who enters Kremlin uh, as a leader of Russia and we should, shouldn't fool ourselves that it's going to be any easier uh, ever since Putin is gone uh, from Kremlin uh, so we have to be ready for long-term uh, kind of uh, to say um, competition uh, to put mildly in terms of uh, uh, foreign policy of uh, what we understand should be in 21st century or how um, uh, some in Russia think that, uh, that the foreign policy as it was in during 19th century is, is very valid uh, but um, one last point on, on, on Russia before going to the uh, strategy of uh, five steps. I would like to outline uh, what we should do as a West, uh, seeing uh, this kind of Russia. You said that uh, there is a big distinction between leadership <coughs> regime and uh, people in Russia. Lastly, uh, on uh, Russian goals, they have long-term strategy towards West. They don't accept the, our vision that the Cold War is over. Cold War never ended for them, at least for this leadership. You could call it a bit differently, put it like hybrid new, new Cold War or 
uh, whatever terminology you uh, see, but they are not happy about the architecture, European security architecture, which was uh, created after post-Berlin Wall uh, fall in 1989. Uh, and uh, they are going to seek, and they, they do it year by year, and very successfully, by the way, uh, in terms of uh, re, uh, trying to reshape the architecture, the security architecture in Europe. But most importantly, they are seeking to dismantle unity within the Western world, uh, attacking both organizations like EU and NATO, but also our value system. And this is something what is going on daily and also very visible, I must say, here, uh, before 23rd of June. Uh, if you look at Russian propaganda channels, they very much highlight the uh, possibility of Brexit, and they would applaud if uh, this uh, can occur, as they did after the Dutch referendum uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Now, now knowing all this, knowing that we're going to get a uh, huge and long-term challenge uh, uh, from East, what we should do. We understand that, and we have seen that the hopes that we can change something within Russia, it's an uh, illusion, it's a big illusion. Uh, it's a generational issue, and first and foremost, generational for Russia and Russians themselves. But what we can do in order to avoid these black or semi black scenarios, what uh, are uh, in the headlines of international media nowadays, we have to really unite our efforts, uh, understanding that Russia is posing existential net threat not only Baltic states, but to Western, to the way of life we, we have used to live in many ways. Yes, it's very difficult at the times, and we have so many other challenges, and probably in the Western Europe more visible ones, like when, when we're talking about Daesh or, or terrorism and, uh, and other uh, threats, but uh, Believe me, this is something what is much more existential for uh, NATO and uh, EU. Uh, the Russian uh, aggressive policy nowadays, and already for many years, uh, can it's basically only force what can uh, really uh, uh, break uh, unity uh, within NATO, within uh, European Union and uh, dismantle this, uh, what was created uh, 60, 70 years ago in, on the European continent after the Second World War. So, first step, we should commonly recognize the, that threat is existing and what, uh, that the threat perception should be understood from Lisbon to Tallinn, from uh, Athens to, to London. I must say, I have a feeling uh, working uh, as parliamentarian for many years within uh, EU NATO uh, colleagues, so with uh, NATO EU colleagues, this threat perception today is much better than it used to be uh, years ago when we were basically alone to tell that, uh, hey guys, things are not going the right direction. Uh, secondly, uh, while, as I said, Russia is seeking to, to break our unity, it is absolutely paramount to maintain it. Uh, I know how difficult it is at the time when right-wing populism is growing in many countries, including in my country as well, uh, and um, there are many questions why Europe or European Union has not delivered, and here I agree again with uh, our keynote speaker that uh, some crises beyond our borders are not are also connected to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, failures uh, of uh, foreign security policy uh, from uh, our side, uh, including also what has happened in Ukraine in 2013, 2014. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely paramount to, to keep uh, unity and uh, to work on uh, common strategies. So hopefully, the common, uh, the global strategy of EU, which is under preparation today, can give some kind of guidelines, including also this, at the same time, NATO summit in Warsaw, 
is a is a perfect place to show this unity uh, among uh, allies and uh, Western countries. And here I come to the third point: Russia must be deterred strongly, vividly, and understandably for them. Russia understands strength. Diplomacy, yes, extremely important. Yes, it's very important to uh, find a ways for uh, discussion and, uh, as you mentioned, today's meeting in Brussels. Um, but it's uh, fruitful only if they understand that there is a strong uh, response if something uh, goes wrong. And this is why our report, what we yesterday, uh, as you mentioned, uh, published uh, or actually we commissioned from ICDS our think tank uh, which is uh, uh, about strengthening the strategic balance in the Baltic Sea area. This is absolutely key at the moment to, uh, to focus on, uh, on uh, when we're talking about deterrence uh, uh, measures. But again, let me argue that this is not only about Baltics. It's about uh, the line from Arctic Sea to Black Sea to Mediterranean. A couple of years ago I was in uh, Japan, I met uh, their commander of uh, uh, Air Force. He told me Russia is uh, as active as pulling as uh, during uh, the most hottest Cold War days. So they are everywhere basically showing uh, their intentions. Fourth, uh, Ukraine is an absolutely key uh, question when uh, we are dealing with current uh, aggressive Russian lands. Uh, we have to, and we have to be, uh, assist Ukraine as much as we can. And uh, this is something which is uh, difficult, I can see, because uh, Ukrainian uh, government uh, has been uh, lately not per perhaps as much as delivering as we had hoped. But I agree, when I was in Maidan 2014 during this uh, January events, uh, I understood immediately, these people are there to stay, to die for their freedom, for democracy, for something perhaps they still don't understand, but they do want to live as we do, not like people in East of them. From them. And the last point, the fifth point, uh, we must stand for it, our values and the way of life. There is a, perhaps a bit, one of the biggest misunderstandings I understand is that, oh, today we don't have ideological confrontation between Russia and uh, the West as it happened during First Cold War or during, uh, let's say, after the Second World War. I argue today this confrontation is even higher than it used to be during uh, those days. And that's not about, let's not talk about Leninism, Marxism and Communism. That's uh, empty slogans uh, that time. Nobody believed in the Soviet period. We believed in Soviet period. But it's uh, about either free, uh, to, to we talk about a free society, a rule of law based society, or totalitarian autocracy uh, rules of society. Uh, and this is where we have huge. Uh, difference and there is a, certainly in my understanding an ideological confrontation going on at the moment and this is what we see uh, in uh, these hybrid measures what Russia is using uh, the new tools uh, uh, propaganda warfare what is the uh, topic of the next panel I will stop here uh, on this optimistic uh, note that uh, if we know <laughs> what we can do we can do it thank you, thank you very much